Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this series of garden and cooking shows is being filmed by NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television, in my garden here in Norfolk. I'm in my herb garden. It's the end of August. Labor Day is right around the corner, and it is very hot today. Today uh, may be the start of a little heat wave, the end of August, and we're out in the sun this morning, but we're gonna work a little quicker. Uh, I'm in the herb garden, and I'm really enjoying using the herbs in the kitchen and picking them, and then we'll, I'm gonna dry a few too, and I need to start some others from cuttings. So I have some uh, scented geraniums, which will go, and I'm gonna just take the tops off of these, and I have several others as well, and these I'm going to use as cuttings a little later in the program. I can also do that with rosemary, though I have had mixed luck with that, but we'll try taking a little off the top and also putting those in to make cuttings that will grow new little plants. You can grow plants, many of them, from cuttings. Some of them can be root pruned. In other words, you dig up a bit of root and plant that and you'll get a new plant. And others, you collect the seeds and start new plants from that. It's kind of fun to propagate your own plants, to either share with others or put in new places in your yard. Also, I'm picking things to dry. And today I'm gonna to pick some lemon verbena. This is one of my favorites. It is not hardy, it's a more tropical herb, but uh, I'd like to dry some for making tea. It's particularly good as a tea, or mixed with tea. And also, the dried leaves are very nice mixed with rice, especially with fish, dishes, or chicken. So I want to dry some of that, and hopefully we'll get it to, by pruning it, grow a few more sprigs before the frost comes and kills it. Let's move over to the perennial garden. The perennial garden is, some of the plants are going, the summer bloomers. The fall bloomers are just getting started. We have a calla, canna lily in the back that's putting up a nice red bloom. Butterfly bush is blooming. The uh, grasses are starting to seed. And uh, the boltonia has some nice buds. It will have a little daisy-like flower. But I would like to add a little more color. And it's, you can do that now. Fall planting season is now or shortly. Fall planting is tricky, especially when it's hot and dry. So you, if you do plant something now, you want to make sure to water it. Now, this, actually, I'm planting an annual, which is Vobinia venariensis, and it was a potted plant. You'll notice that the roots are kind of bound, so I will loosen those up a little. And I bought this one particularly because I want to save seed from it. It is an annual, but you can start them from seed. So when this goes to seed, I will save its seeds. And some of it may just seed right here in place. Otherwise, I will start some to put in my garden next year. And I had already dug a little hole for it. I'll make a little well around this plant so that I can be sure to give it some good water. Put its label in. and give it a good drink. I'll probably want to repeat this, the water, the next couple days, especially if it stays so hot. I can also water any pots I have. This is uh, Nicotiana. And I notice another pot of it down here that's uh, in need of a little water. Any of the potted plants that are out right now can probably use an extra drink when it's really hot. We're starting to, uh, we're continuing the deadheading of things that have gone by. Sometimes you'll get a second uh, crop or second blooming out of them. Sometimes you will not, but you're ahead of the game for fall. Try to keep the weeds cleaned up though. 
each weed that goes to seed will give you up to 10,000 new weeds next year and probably for another 10 years. Many weed seeds stay in the ground and live for a very long time. The longer you garden in a particular spot, if you keep it weeded, the fewer weeds you'll have over the long run. So it is important to get them out, especially before they go to seed, unless you want them to go to seed. And that's the case with this butterfly weed. It's still putting up some blooms, but it has some nice seed pods. These seeds, once they're ripe, I will remove the pods and save the seeds for this one so that I can start some new plants. The roses are giving us a last flush of bloom. These I will not deadhead at this time any longer. We want the roses to start thinking about going to sleep for the winter. And uh, one way to do that is to just let them form rose hips or a, a little seed head. They will form a rose hip for each bloom and we'll let that go along. I have some uh, artemisia and that I'm going to cut back and this makes a wonderful dried flower for a wreath or a fall arrangement. It's starting to go to seed. I don't really want this one to go to seed. It has some seed heads on it which are attractive when dried but I don't want too much more of it in here because it's a thug that could take over if I let it. And uh, I'd like to keep a small amount of it, but not a great amount. We've had a lot of uh, hummingbird activity over here. I have blue phlox, a blue salvia, and a purple butterfly bush. And the hummingbird, and also a hummingbird feeder, but they've been attracted mostly to the blue salvia. It's been a real hummingbird magnet the last few days, and hopefully we can share a picture of that. They also like the uh, other blooms in the garden, but they particularly like the salvia. It's a good source of nectar for them. The smoke bush has put up one long spike. I moved the smoke bush from another location a year ago, and I'm going to leave it the way it is now, but I really would prefer a multi-stem bush, so next spring, I will cut that long spike back and hope that it forms two or three new branches there so that I get a little bushier plant. The rest of the garden is just to be enjoyed at this point. We have more uh, lemon verbena over here that, I, again, I can cut for tea. I have lavender that's gone, so I'll deadhead that. Probably wait for a little cooler day to do much garden work. Another one that will go is the heliotrope. And I really like heliotrope, and I may try a few cuttings of that later, or dig up the plant and try to move it inside and hold it over for the winter. Haven't been too successful in the past. I've been able to get it to about April, and then I lose it. So it's always worth another try if you have the space. Now let's go over to the vegetable garden and see what's happening over there. I grow flowers also in the vegetable garden, and they've come into bloom lately. Uh, the dahlia is actually outside the, the vegetable garden, but it's uh, really putting on the blooms. It likes the warm weather. It likes the moisture we've had. This is a particularly nice variety. I forget its name. I've kept it over by digging up the uh, root each fall and storing it inside. I've had it maybe five years. It's a purple and yellow mix, which I find pretty attractive. And uh, the blooms were really nice to bring inside. This is an annual, which is Bright Lights Cosmos. Uh, many people think it's a marigold. The leaves look a little marigold-like, but it is a cosmos. And again, it attracts some of the pollinators. And it's just a bright spot in the garden. This is Mexican sunflower. Hard to believe such a plant of this size came from a tiny little seed planted a couple months ago. But here it is, and it's uh, called Mexican Torch, I think is the variety. It comes in both orange and yellow, and it really is a magnet for butterflies. At certain times of the day, it will be covered with different butterflies, so it's something I always like to grow. It really does grow up like a sunflower in that it gets quite large, but it's not a traditional sunflower in that it, its seeds, it doesn't have the large array of seeds in the middle. Marigolds down here on the ground. I've planted these around the edge of the garden, hopefully to uh, keep some of the pests out. They haven't been totally effective. 
as they never are, but they are kind of cheerful and they will bloom all the way till the first frost. As long as you keep them deadheaded a little bit, and that means just snapping off any blooms that are gone. And uh, if you keep doing that, they'll keep blooming. They respond very well to that treatment. I've planted a few second crops in the garden and we're still picking, of course, our first crops. This is a yellow pear tomato and they have been most prolific this year. I have several plants of that and I've been picking them regularly. We'll use those in the kitchen a little bit later. I dug the onions that had been growing here. Uh, I have some small onions. I've used many of them as green onions, but these have been laying out in the sun and that's called field curing. So after they've been out here a little while, I'll put them in a bag. I can actually take a brush and brush them off a little bit so you don't get as much dirt. And then these will go into store right next to the garlic that we processed a couple weeks ago. Again, by digging, and that one you cure inside. The onions you can cure, field cure or outside. Unless, of course, you're getting too much rain and then you'd want to move it inside. You want them to get dry, and certainly this weather the last few days with 90 degree temperatures is going to let them dry really well. Those then we can continue to use into fall. These are radishes that I planted about two weeks ago, and they need to be thinned a little bit. And I'll do that. And I'll keep weeding. This year, because of all the rain, the weeds have also had a field day, so some time weeding the garden does pay off. I also have lettuce and cilantro out here and a little spinach. The spinach may not do well this year because of the heat. It likes cooler weather. And I may need to plant a little more later. But I'm going to use a little all-purpose fertilizer Next to this row of new seedlings, the first crop perhaps took some out of the soil, so particularly with the second crop, I like to add a little bit of all-purpose organic fertilizer along the edge of the row. And this will get uh, watered in or rained in as we go. The strawberries are putting out roots uh, and runners, and they root where they touch down so that the size of my strawberry patch is going to increase. I have more things planted over here. Where I took the onions out now, I can also plant, but I think I'll wait till the heat wave is over instead of planting it when it's 90 degrees. We'll wait until the temperatures moderate a little bit. I have plenty of arugula. This is, uh, I think, the third planting of arugula. We tend to like it, it's a spicy green, and it makes a nice salad with a more pungent dressing, perhaps a little blue cheese and some walnuts, and some tomatoes. I have some hot peppers down here that are starting to put on some hot peppers. I don't need too many of them, but uh, having a few jalapenos is very nice. My tomatoes, I took off the uh, majority of the foliage that was going bad, and you can do that if you have dead foliage at the base of the tomatoes. You can just remove it and get rid of it. And this kind of helps keep diseases from spreading. To be careful with that. We're still getting a very few raspberries, maybe a handful at a time. But the crop is almost finished and it'll be soon time to remove the net from those. Other crops include kale, and Swiss chard, broccoli, which is still putting up lots of little uh, sprouts. It's about time for me to go in and cut it back fairly hard. Then I'll get some larger pieces from the broccoli. The Brussels sprouts are doing well. I keep spraying those so that uh, they will, with uh, the organic insecticide to keep some of the insects off. They're a very long season crop to get any Brussels sprouts. And they will last through frost, but you need to keep them growing. We have cabbages and summer squash, cucumbers. My cucumbers gone crazy with all this rain. And I have some eggplant also growing in that area and parsley. I'm getting some beans. Uh, the rabbits are still at it. I planted a few more beans here and I noticed uh, the rabbits kindly 
pruned them for me as soon as they came up. So I suspect the last beans will be the ones that they left. I guess they don't like them when they get old and tough. I have annual flowers planted, uh, zinnias, another butterfly favorite, and one of my favorites for picking to bring inside. If you keep picking your zinnias, they keep pulling out the bloom. So be sure to keep them picked and enjoy the flowers from your garden. The red plant is amaranth, and I will regret letting it grow because it will reseed all over the garden next year, but I do enjoy it, and I love picking it and putting it in a vase with some of the other flowers. I just think it's such a pretty plant. That one is uh, a plant that can be, the grain from it, which is the seed head, can be consumed, though I don't do it, and it has been used in the past as a dye plant. Uh, the colonial people did not have access to dyes the way they did in England, and they grew their own plants, and I guess they did in England as well, to dye the fabrics that they used in their clothing. And amaranth, this one is called Hopi Red Dye, so it was probably used by Native Americans to dye some of their textiles. And it's, it's really a pretty plant. But again, it does go to seed, and don't grow it unless you plan to do a lot of weeding out when it comes up next year, or you'll have way too much of it in the garden. I also have some perpetual spinach here that we can pick, and that will continue as long as we pick the outer leaves. The same with the kale and the chard. If we pick the outer leaves, it will uh, continue to produce for us, possibly through frost. Here's, I'm noticing another lovely weed. And if you have these, pull them now, because they turn into sand burrs later, what we always called sand burrs and they'll stick to everything in the garden. So you want to be sure to pick that type of weed before it can spread. It's time to enjoy the garden and the produce. Uh, put some up for fall, perhaps. I've been uh, picking and processing cucumbers, made a few things with those. Tomatoes will be done a little later. And herbs, uh, we have lemon thyme, lime thyme, uh, a opal thyme, which is a dark color, and then, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, not thyme, it's basil. Lemon basil, lime basil, uh, opal basil, and then just the regular basil for pesto, too. Uh, it's often the one you see in the stores would be the regular one. But there are other varieties of basil that can be very good. We'll use some of that in the kitchen a little later. Now it's time to go over and set those cuttings and perhaps take a few more. Okay, it's time to set some cuttings. I've already done a few, and uh, I did some cuttings of a penta uh, plant, which I have in the backyard on the back patio, and during one of the rainstorms, one of the branches broke. So I used that as an opportunity to take a few cuttings. I do not know if penta will grow from cuttings, but it's always worth a try to see if I can get at least a few of them to root, and then I'll have a new plant for next year. I was sad to see it broke, but what else can you do except throw it away? But I cut off the tips. Now we're, what we're going to do is use some rooting powder, and this is uh, a rooting hormone. Now many plants will root without using it, but it does improve your odds. And it's a hormone that encourages the plant to grow. And I put a little in a cup, and then uh, for each cutting, I want to cut it right below where a leaf is coming out. And I'll take off the leaves. Then I'll dip it into the rooting powder, into the tip, and then put it into the compost, which I've put in the cups. Compost or potting soil. I happen to have some nice compost, so I'll be using that. I'll do the same with the rosemary, taking off some of the lower stems, and then we want to, any place where the leaves come out, the nodes, is an opportunity for the plant to grow, and we'll snug those in. The lemon verbena we're going to take in the house. It's good to pick these early in the day while they're still green and somewhat full of fluid, and then uh, I'm going to take some cuttings from coleus. 
and coleus really roots well. And again, we'll just take some of the top cuttings. And so again, we want to cut, trim it right under a leaf node and pull off those lower leaves, put it in the rooting powder and into the soil. Now, in the case of something with large leaves like this, I'll probably cut those leaves in half. The plant's going to need the moisture and the energy to make a new plant. So we'll try to use some of the smaller leaves. With smaller leaves I can leave, leave, but bigger ones. And again, you just want it under a leaf node and then into the, the pots. In a couple weeks, you can kind of gently tug on these cuttings, and you should see that they are rooted. That means that they will give some resistance when you tug on them. And after they've been rooted for a while, and you can uh, use a pencil to make a hole to put the cutting in, especially if it's a tender leafed item. goes along fairly fast. These cuttings will grow inside over the winter. I'm going to use my pencil again. About three or four to each little pot. Then when they are rooted, each individual cutting will get its own pot inside and be watered and fertilized throughout the winter and ready to put back in the planter. And again, we want to give them Make sure we keep them well watered. That's one of the tricks, and that's why I keep it here near the house so by other plants, so I'm sure to remember to give it some water. This is a kind of semi-shaded area. It does get some sun a little later, but it's in the shade much of the day. So that's a good place. If you have a kind of shady place for them, it works out best. This whole plant, and you can see the side of it, was all from cuttings I took last summer. The same way I'm doing it now, I put them in the pot, maybe four or five of each of the coleus, and you can see it's growing quite well. I do keep it deadheaded. Again, it tries to bloom, and I just snap off any blooms because I prefer the foliage. If you like the little blooms, why well, you can keep them, but I like just the foliage. And then each time you pinch it back in the middle, it branches out. So it will really fill up a whole pot rather quickly with maybe half a dozen plants. And you can also add different colors if, if you choose. Uh, coleus comes in various colors. You can also grow it from seed in the spring inside, starting it inside, and you'll have some more. In fact, I think I started at least one of these. Or you can get it at the garden center. But it really does, can fill up a pot in a semi-shady area quite a shady area. Okay, now let's go up to another pot. This pot has not only annuals, and these are begonias. This one is a red begonia, which is not in bloom right now. It has buds, but it's not in bloom. I have a geranium in here, which I will probably cut or take cuttings. Uh, a canna, which I will dig. I'll dig the bulbs from these dahlias as well and try to save them. I do uh, deadhead these as I go, once they start looking a little shabby. But in the middle of this, I have a hookera, or a coral bell, which would be the common name, and it is um, caramel. Now, it's not gonna make it through the winter in a pot like this, it will freeze. So very soon now, as soon as this heat wave breaks, I'm gonna dig this uh, hookera up and move it into my garden so that I can keep it, hopefully over the winter, nicely, and perhaps even divide it next spring if I want to put it back in the pot. But this has been growing all summer in the pot, in the planter, and if you have perennials in your planters, very soon it will be time to remove them and plant them in the ground so that they can survive. Otherwise, the roots will probably freeze. If you do have perennials that you want to put in a large planter, be sure that they are 
rated for at least two growing zones colder than you are. Well, that means one that is able to grow in zone three or four might survive here. Certainly anything much less and you will lose it over the winter. Perennials look nice in containers, but in our climate they just don't. You see all the beautiful pictures in the magazines of the lovely perennials mixed in with the annuals. And certainly in Virginia or further south, they probably do just fine. But here you have to either remove them to the house or to the garden in order to keep them over the winter to replant the next spring. We're starting to look ahead to fall. It isn't here yet, and lately our frosts have been quite late, but uh, we do have to start thinking about it. It used to be right after Labor Day we could expect to frost any time. That's kind of extended out. I guess that's what global warming is all about. We tend to have a little longer season in the fall. But uh, have a plan to cover up any plants or move them if the forecast does say that a frost might come. Now let's go over to another planter. This is another planter that's been out front all season. This is a uh, red petunia and it has been here all summer. I've been fertilizing it and watering it. We've gotten a lot of water this year. Often by now some of these things are completely gone. This one I've cut back quite a lot in hopes that I will get some bloom for fall. But I do want to add a fall blooming plant and this is a little little chrysanthemum. I found that my uh, window boxes usually by now need some refreshing and usually you can't find a plant the size that would fit in a window box in the fall. But this year I found in some of the nurseries that they do have some plants that will fit in the fall. Uh, I've still got some buds on the geraniums and again once it's a little cooler they will thrive. But I want to put in this little red chrysanthemum and this will continue to grow and we can uh, hopefully get some fall blooms to add to any of the perennials that are, or the annuals that are left. And if the petunia does not show signs of recovery in a couple weeks, then I can also replace it. Again, I can take cuttings of the geranium that's here. Uh, there are a number of areas that we can cut and root. Geraniums root very easily and you can grow cuttings of those. I think I had 12 cuttings last spring and I've put them in pots here and there. And they're doing quite well. And they're easy enough to do. If you have a sunny spot, it's worth it. Again, you need to keep fertilizing these pots to keep them blooming. Uh, any long extended fertilizer you put in when you planted them back by Memorial Day, by Labor Day is long gone. So in order to keep them going, you need to keep the plants deadheaded, in the case of this verbena particularly, and the, uh, also the geranium. Cut off any old blooms as they go. Keep it fertilized and you should be able to keep a planter going until frost. My hydrangeas have been pretty happy with the summer. This is a normally white blooming hydrangea, but as they age they turn this uh, bright green and that means it's time to cut them. And uh, I like to cut them for fall arrangements. And some of the ones down at the bottom have already dried a little too much. And those I'll probably just cut off. But the ones that are still nice and green, we can put in a basket and dry them. You can make a wreath out of them or just put them in a basket. They make a very nice fall decoration. Once they're fully dry, you can uh, paint them or they won't change much. They will eventually turn brown, but it takes quite a while. They'll last pretty much all winter in this uh, lime green state. 
few more off. There we have our basket full. Now we can go back and feed the fish. They're extra hungry on a hot day. My fish are getting bigger. I feed them a, one or two times a day, especially in hotter weather, I like to feed them a little more. Uh, fish tend to be more active. Their metabolism goes with the weather. In the winter time, they hardly move. They're kind of in suspended animation as they float around the pond. And they aren't using much food then either, so we don't even feed them once the temperature goes below 50. But when the temperature is up around 90, 95, they're quite active and they appreciate a little extra food. I also notice that they stay in the shady area of the pond a little more too. I have a variety of annuals out here in the garden and these I have been fertilizing about every week to 10 days to keep them blooming. Uh, soon the impatience will be setting some seed pods and we can get fat seed pods and we can gather some seeds of impatience that can be planted next February and we'll get more impatience next summer. Again, it, it is the season of almost fall, and you need to think about what you're gonna do with the pond in the fall and winter. This pond happens to be under quite a few trees, which means all these leaves are gonna come down out of the sky, and I need to make sure that I cover the pond with a net. And so I have my net, I have to make sure that it doesn't have any holes in it, and I'll be putting that over the net probably within another month as the leaves start to fall. Eventually I will take out the skimmer and the waterfall and the pond will just be without plants or anything. I actually leave the iris in because it's very hardy, but the rest of the plants will either come inside or be put in the compost. The fish will be quiet and start to quiet down as it uh, becomes fall and the temperature's less. And I also need to think about something to keep a hole open in the pond all winter. The fish will live in the pond even though it gets very cold as long as there's a hole in the ice. And I use a pond heater to do that. And I think I need to order a new one this year so this is a, a good time to start thinking about things like that. If you need a net or if you need a heater, the time to order is now, not when you have temperatures that are going way low and the pond is going to freeze over. So again, it's not fall yet, we're still enjoying summer, but it's time to start thinking about what you're going to do with some of your areas come fall, and this is one of them, and some of the plants. Start deciding what you want to bring inside, what you want to uh, maybe share with somebody else, in other words, give it away, or uh, that maybe its days are numbered and it's time to go. Another month, uh, I'll start repotting some of the plants I want to bring in so that they can stay outside a little longer before they come in the house. But if they're root bound, they need to be repotted before they come inside because they have the whole winter to grow before you really want to get out and work with a lot of dirt inside. You don't particularly want to do that, so you want to do your repotting outdoors if necessary. Now let's go inside and cook up some of the things from the garden. It's really nice to be able to use some fresh produce from the garden. And I'm also putting away a few things for winter as I go. But first I'm going to start by using some of my yellow squash. Yellow squash and zucchini can be pretty prolific. And I'm always looking for new recipes to use it. This one is a galette, which is a crust, kind of a free-form crust. And I'm going to roll out pie pastry for one pie crust. And I want to roll that out to 12 or 14 inch circle. I happen to make the pie crust, but uh, feel free to use that that you get in the store. Again, you'll, if you buy a purchased one, you'll need to roll it a little larger than that comes. And I'm going to put that on top of a
parchment lined baking sheet. And it's over, okay if it hangs over a little because it's going to be folded in. And then I'll make a filling. And the filling I'm using is about six tablespoons of uh, cream cheese, which has been softened. And to that I will add some ricotta cheese, a couple tablespoons of ricotta, and also about a quarter cup of mozzarella cheese. And I'll mix that in. So lemony cheese and, and squash galette. And then I have half a clove of garlic to mix in and some salt and pepper. And I put those in together, about a quarter teaspoon each, eighth to a quarter of salt and pepper. And again, we'll mix that in. Then add the juice and grated peel of half a lemon. You could also use ricotta cheese. The original recipe did use ricotta. I didn't have any when I made it the first time, and we like the cream cheese, so. It was a good substitute. I'm also going to add about a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of olive oil. To this mixture. And then spread it in the middle of this crust. The yellow squash has been sliced thinly and then uh, salted and then uh, drained. I rinsed it a little bit to get some of the salt off. And if you wish to be fancy, you can just uh, arrange it neatly. Otherwise, you can just put it on. It's still uh, a little juicy. So we want to get all the liquid off that we can. I did dry it initially, but in the bowl it's picked up a little more. And then I'm going to drizzle a little more olive oil on this, probably about two teaspoons worth. And then I'll fold the crust up and pleat it as I go around the edges. Spread it out a little bit. This is a free form tart. You can make tarts like this with apples or other things. Add a little extra lemon there, we'll add. Lemon and yellow squash seem to be a very nice combination. And then at last I will use an egg yolk beaten with a teaspoon of water and paint the crust. And we'll put this in the oven at 400 degrees for about 30 minutes. 30 to 35 minutes. And then we'll move over and work on another oven thing. This will go in at a different temperature. And this is a way to preserve some of the tomatoes. As I said, my yellow pear tomato has been going crazy. So these have been washed and halved, and I've sprayed a foil-lined baking sheet with some uh, cooking spray. And I'm going to arrange the tomatoes halves in this pan. I 
Again, I wash them and have them. And then I'll sprinkle them with a little sliced garlic. I've sliced it instead of chopping it because we're going to leave these in the oven a while and I want the garlic to roast rather than burn. And we'll drizzle these with a little olive oil. And these will not be finished before we're finished today. Because I'm going to leave them in a 300 degree oven for probably an hour and a half. They will get slightly browned and very uh, soft and roasted and they'll dry somewhat. If you want to continue drying them, you can dry them all the way down and then put them in the freezer. I won't, wouldn't dry anything dry enough to store just at room temperature. Uh, I would be afraid I wouldn't get all the moisture out and I would have spoilage. But you can dry tomatoes this way and dry them all the way down till they're very hard and dry. We prefer them roasted until they're about maybe a third the size that they are going into the oven. I may stir them once or twice during the process, but then they're really great just spread on bread, maybe with a little cheese, but definitely just spread on bread. You have the, the roasted garlic and tomato flavor, and it makes just a great little lunch or dinner appetizer. So I'll put these in a 300 degree oven, and I'll set the timer on that one for about an hour. At that point, I can stir them and uh, then continue cooking. Another thing I can do for freezing, and I'm into uh, doing some of the processing now. Again, we picked some of the lemon verbena to dry, and I'll be drying that. But I want to make some pesto to put in the freezer. And pesto is a mixture of garlic, basil, some sort of nut, pine nuts, walnuts, almonds, all can be used in different recipes. Cheese, sometimes if you freeze it, people don't add the cheese until later. I tend to add it now. Olive And olive oil. And this one that I'm making today, I'm going to use lemon pesto. And I have quite a bit of it here. And I need about two and a half cups. And you can, I've washed it. And I also have in the processor right now, about four cloves of garlic. And I'm gonna spin that a little bit chop it up some and then I will add the uh, lemon basil. Lemon basil it'll be a nice pesto to maybe put on pasta and serve with fish and you can use your stems too. Just the whole thing can go right in there and we're going to chop it up. And we probably have to push it down a little from time to time. Cut this a little more, and we'll take off some of the stems. And we'll add the nuts and the cheese, and uh, I think it will come together a little better with some liquid. And three tablespoons of olive oil, quarter of a. Uh, I used almonds in this one. Three tablespoons of olive oil and half a cup of Parmesan cheese. There we go, we're starting to... And you just want to grind this up. And you can also add a tablespoon of water if you wanted a little oil, or more oil if you wanted a little finer chopped. Originally pesto was made in a mortar and pestle by hand and some people still prefer to do it that way. I kind of like the modern conveniences of the food processor. It makes quick work of it. Okay. And now, in order to put this into the freezer, 
what I'll use is an ice cube tray. And I'll just put, uh, because with a two servings of pasta, really one cube ice cube tray worth is enough for seasoning. If I want more, I can always thaw more than one cube. But I'll just pack this all ultimately into the ice cube tray and stick it in the freezer. And then when it's frozen, I'll bring it out and thaw it just enough to get those individual cubes out so that I can put them into a plastic bag and return them to the freezer. If you're using different kinds of uh, nuts, pine nuts, different types of basil, be sure to label it so you know what you have because it all looks the same once it's finished. And this probably will make a whole ice cube tray full. And we'll just put that out here for now. Also for preserving, I have done some, uh, as I said, my pickle, my cucumber was going wild. So I've made bread and butter pickles and also some pickle relish from uh, cucumbers. Farmer's Market supplied some peaches, so I also made peach jam and canned some peaches. Peaches can really well. And if you are interested in doing home canning, jam and jelly making, I would recommend the Ball Blue Book or a similar type book. The internet can be really undependable for canning recipes. Uh, the recipes in this type of book or one that's put out by one of the university uh, extension departments is generally a good resource. And this is an older book, but where canning supplies are sold, the Ball Corporation makes canning supplies and they put out this book almost annually. And it gives pictured directions for pickles and peaches and jams. And is for somebody who's starting to do any canning or pickling, or making jam, it's a very good resource and it's a dependable one so that your canned goods will not only be safe for you to consume, but you won't lose a lot of cans to spoilage. Uh, so be sure to follow a good reference. Uh, you can't just can. Most of these things do require some recipes to get good results. Uh, sometimes you can can and have the results be safe, but they aren't very attractive. Uh, for instance, the fruit will turn an ugly shade of brown, or the peaches or the pickles will be very soft. So following good directions is always a good choice. I don't use pressure canning in order to can vegetables that are not acidic, or unless you add a lot of acid to them. You do need to use a pressure canner. Now that doesn't mean a pressure cooker or an instant pot, it means a pressure canner. Uh, I no longer have one. I once did have one for things like beans and corn, but uh, now I just do what's called a boiling water bath. I have a boiling water bath canner, and that's what I use to do my pickles, my jams, and fruits. The next thing I'm going to do is a main dish, and it is Swiss chard with fennel sausage and pasta. And I'm going to start by sauteing some fennel sausage. I have about three quarters of a pound. And we'll saute that. And while that's cooking, I will explain what I did with the Swiss chard. This is the end product of the Swiss chard that we're going to use a quarter cup of, around a quarter cup of. And in order to, this was a whole bunch of Swiss chard and uh, probably a dozen or so leaves. I separated the leaves from the stems and cut the stems into quarter inch pieces and cooked those in some olive oil with garlic and onion. And I cooked that for about 10 minutes, then added the leaves, and then cooked that again for maybe 20 minutes until it formed this uh, 
very uh, reduced mixture. I mean, this is all that's left of a large bunch of Swiss chard. And I'm just going to use a little of this in the sauce for this dish. Now that we've browned the sausage a bit, I'm going to add about a quarter of a cup of the Swiss chard mixture. And I can use the rest of the Swiss chard mixture in a few days. Uh, they suggested underneath fish as uh, kind of a side dish. And I'm going to mix that in. And we'll saute this a little bit. I'm going to add a little pepper, freshly ground, to this. And we'll add uh, about a half a cup of chicken stock. You could also use pasta water or vegetable stock or whatever you have. And we're going to let that cook for a few minutes. And then we'll add oh, one and a half tablespoons of butter. And we'll use the... And melt that into the sauce. At this point, if you hadn't already pre-cooked your pasta, you could turn this off and uh, use the time to cook the pasta. But this is six ounces of orochette, which is little ears in Italian. And then I will add about a quarter cup of Parmesan cheese, grated. And a tablespoon of olive oil, robustly flavored. Once everything is mixed together, that will be our pasta dish. I'll move that up to another burner that's off. And we'll finish that with some toasted breadcrumbs, which breadcrumbs which have been toasted in the oven and a little bit of olive oil and salt added to them. And that's the finishing for the dish. And this would generally be done after you put it on the plate, but We'll do it while it's in the pan to give it a nice look. Our squash should be finished and our crust nice and brown. And it should just slide right off the uh, parchment paper onto the plate, which is always nice when something that you bake doesn't stick and comes off, which is why we do use parchment paper a lot. So I have a yellow squash galette, which could be served as an appetizer or a side dish. We have the fennel sausage with Swiss chard. And I've made some cookies because it is still summer. I made a few cookies out of my brown sugar shortbread recipe, which I think we may have made together at one point on this show. But I made them into sand dollars this time by adding five almonds and then using, uh, actually, the probe for my meat thermometer to make a little indentation in the cookie itself. I sprinkled them with some raw sugar or uh, the unprocessed sugar that's a little more uh, 
coarse to look like sand and made some sand dollars to go with this. Another thing, uh, going back to processing, I've been drying herbs, so I have quite a few little herbs that I've dried. I have dill seed and the mint that we picked before and sage. These are dried and put into little containers. And another thing I've done is to put in the freezer, and I'm going to get it from the freezer. I made pie filling, and my recipe for pie filling, regular flour or cornstarch probably won't hold up in the freezer, but tapioca does. So I used the tapioca as a thickener, along with sugar and a little bit of flour, and my sliced peaches. And then I packed it in a plastic bag, which I put into a foil pie pan. As you can see, it took on the shape of the pan. So when it comes time to make a peach pie in the middle of winter when it's snowing outside like crazy, I can just use this frozen pie filling, remove it from the bag, add it to the pastry, a pastry on the bottom, and then put in the frozen pie filling, put the crust on top, and bake it at a higher temperature for about an hour. This is another one of the recipes that I did find in one of the canning and freezing books that I have. And it's a great way to have some pies ready to cook in the winter if you're busy and you need a dessert really fast. Having some frozen pies available is very nice. When you do peaches, you also need to use an acidic ingredient. This has lemon juice in it. And my canned peaches, I used fruit fresh, which is an ascorbic acid or vitamin C which is uh, very good for you anyway. And you add a little of that to your peaches and they keep their color. And it's important to use that when you have peaches or pl light colored plums or apples for that matter, if you're going to freeze them especially. That concludes a walk in the garden for today. I'm Liz Davy, and thank you for joining me. You've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable in Norfolk, Massachusetts.